Yes, I am a dreamer. For a dreamer is one who can only find his way by moonlight. And his punishment is that he sees the dawn before the rest of the world. This is my friend Vicky and I. This whole thing was her idea. While studying in Ireland, she was inspired to put on a dinner showcasing the incredible food the country has to offer. We wanted to call the event the Irish Bela, which is Gaelic for meal. And we called it impossible because at many points it seemed like it was. A lot went wrong. Are you kidding? Equipment broke, passports were ruined, we hit a day running pothole in our rental car on the Ring of Kerry, but despite pretty near everything going wrong at some point or other, everything turned out right. So how do you take an idea for an Irish meal and make it a reality? It helps to know what you're talking about. So I hopped on a plane and went to meet Victoria in Dublin. From there, the first stop on our adventure was Cork. We wanted to know where some of the stereotypes surrounding Irish food came from and get a better idea of the story of Irish food. We felt that if you're going to tell a story that's not your own, you better be sure to get the facts straight. So we met with Regina Sexton, food historian and professor at the University of Cork. I'm Regina Sexton and I'm a food and culinary historian at University College Cork and I'm also the coordinator of the postgraduate diploma in Irish food culture. I suppose the interesting thing about Ireland is it's the perception of Irish food culture, and not just in an international setting, but also for Irish people themselves. And I suppose, unfortunately, but understandably, the country has been recognised in terms of food for just a small number of ingredients. The first one, of course, is the potato. And then it's, I suppose, the integration of the potato into various different dishes, like bacon and cabbage and potatoes, corned beef and cabbage and potatoes, potato cakes, box tea, colcannon, and so on. And each of these, in their own right, are very good foods. They're all quite delicious, and they all have a very interesting story to tell. But the story of Irish food, particularly in terms of its evolution and its, its traditional components, is, is a bit more complex than that. And I suppose what you need to do to understand the full history of the story of Irish food, or the full story of Irish food, is to understand the history of Ireland, really. The two are interrelated and they can't be separated. So in that sense, I suppose we are left with a number of stereotypes, which for the most part of the product may be of the 19th century and no, and no, no earlier than that. Whereas the story of our Irish food before the potato is little told. So what was there before the potato in Ireland? We went looking, and like so many times during our stay in Ireland, we found ourselves by the sea, this time at Glen Bay Shellfish Limited. It started with Noah just picking cockles on the seashore. Noel started and I joined him. My background is banking and he's, he was always by the seaside. Well, our company is Glen Bay Shellfish Limited. The company was set up in 1994, so we're, we're in business quite a long time. We actually started at the end of our garden. We had a little centre there, very small, um, very small purification, just a little tank. The purification tank was built, but it really wasn't the capacity. Once the, it was reached capacity, it wasn't purifying properly, so we really had no option either to stop or 
grow our business. So we decided we'd grow our business. We don't harvest mussels or oysters or anything or any of the mollusks. We actually buy them in raw from the farmers. So it's our business to make sure that they are properly purified, cleaned and ready for market. This is what I've, I've been doing for, as I said, 25 years or whatever. And I mean, as Patricia will tell you, as the sun starts to get up in the morning, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, up. I'll get up with it and I'll work here from maybe seven o'clock until maybe seven o'clock in the evening. Give it 24 7. Mm. Like yesterday, which well, was late Saturday night, must be 10 o'clock, mm. the phone rings, restaurant in Killarney, oh, wait a run, we have a, got an, uh, a party coming in tomorrow, 40 people, we haven't enough for muscles. Into the van, Sunday, it doesn't matter, it's Sunday. Mm. If it's, that's what you do, it's your own business. The um, Food Safety Authority of Ireland actually grades the bays for shellfish harvesting. This is why shellfish production is probably one of the safest foods you can eat. The restaurants in our area are certainly putting more and more seafood onto their menu. They need to get a little bit away from the fish and chips. <laughs> mm. We live in an island. We should be exploiting the food that is out there. When I was working at Momofuku, we did this thing where we served oysters with kimchi granita. I always thought it was such an awesome idea. And if there's one thing that Ireland has, it's cabbage. So we used this as the inspiration and went from there. Using horseradish for spice, apple cider vinegar for acid. We got our umami from seaweed instead of fish sauce. Then of course, cabbage, both green and red. Of our many trips around Ireland, visiting Pranny was probably our favorite day. She's probably the coolest person I've ever met, and if you ever have the chance to attend one of her courses, forays, or lectures, do it. It will make you think differently. Uh, my name's Pranny Rattigan, and I live in the northwest coast of Ireland, and I've grown up using seaweeds all my life. And at the moment I work as a medical doctor, so I try and bring what I know from medicine uh, to look critically at the seaweeds. Well, when we were small children, uh, we were brought to the shore um, by my father and uh, he just, he was also a medic and he knew the value of everything at the shore. When I went off to study medicine, I just had no time to really do anything with seaweeds. I was bringing friends down to the beach one day 
and there were um, one of them was a manager in an organic centre and he said oh I've no idea that you knew anything about this you have to come and give us some courses so then I started to give the seaweed courses and uh, then people asked for more and more recipes so I would have just a volume of notes for the people on the courses just a volume and they were you know still wanting more and I said okay I have to book uh, the Irish Seaweed Kitchen and I never cared if anybody ever read it I just had to get down all the recipes When I started to um, bring people to the beach it used to break my heart for people would run out and grab so I had to be very 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 strict that they harvest uh, by just giving the seaweeds a little haircut and nothing else. Just a haircut, you know, take a little, leave lots. I suppose that was one of the reasons that I brought out the guide because I went down to the shore one day and saw people just pulling and tugging in all directions and I thought, gosh, I, you know, I've started this whole business of encouraging people to uh, have an interest in seaweeds and bring about a revival, but I don't want this kind of a revival. So for sustainability, I'm just snipping one out here and this is it. And you don't need much. That's the amazing thing about seaweeds. Less is more. Um, the pepper dulse, or the Osmundi panafidida, is, is just, uh, panafidida, is just a, a gorgeous little seaweed. It's very small, it's on a linear plane, and we saw it there today. And it's just such a fascination for chefs because it's so pungent. It's so small, it looks so innocent, and it's just so pungent. And at the moment they're researching the truffle uh, flavor of that particular seaweed, which is really exciting. Dillisk is another amazing seaweed. I suppose in Ireland, we've known about Dillisk for thousands of years, uh, dating right back to probably the 6th century, uh, when it was stipulated that if somebody called to your door when they were walking from A to B, as part of the Brehon Laws, uh, you had to offer them water and Dillisk, uh, or Dulce, as you, you would pronounce it. We wanted to know if there was any truth to the talk about seaweed being a superfood. Now, as a medical doctor, I have to kind of stick to the medical evidence on that. And it's, it's building, but it's not just there yet. But I would be very, very hopeful that before my career in medicine is over, that we would be able to recommend seaweeds for their anti-inflammatory and for their anti-hypertensive and anti-obesity anti-cancer properties. So we've got our reds, greens and browns. So my mantra is have small amounts of this wide variety from all of the different categories. That's what I feel gives, offers the best health. Small amounts of a wide variety. Links for Cranny's website, recipe book, and foraging guide are all down below. And if you're interested in seaweed, I would definitely recommend them. If you're looking to buy Irish seaweed, we ordered from a company called This Is Seaweed. And if you're looking to try seaweeds in your cooking, that's the site I'd recommend. Paul O'Connor, the company's founder, was so incredibly helpful, super knowledgeable, and we can't recommend them enough.
The next stop on our trip was Galway. We trekked up to Beach Lawn Organic Farm where we met up with chefs J.P. McMahon and Amanda Cohen for a tour of the farm. We wanted to know more about modern Irish cuisine from a chef's perspective. So I'm J.P. McMahon and I'm a chef and restaurateur in Galway in Ireland. Um, all of our restaurants, I suppose, have that as a central core philosophy of trying to buy local or buy sustainable or buy more ethical. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I suppose there's a few different reasons. One is economical. I mean, uh, I think the when we buy from a local producer, they benefit. Um, one of them is more sustainable. It's not traveling as far. Um, and I suppose in, the ter in terms of organic or in terms of wild food, the, there's, a, there's an ethical choice there, which, which, I think is, uh, which I think is important. And I think it, it, when you do it in a restaurant, I suppose it shows people um, the, the side of things that they might see. I do think over the last 10 or 15 years, Irish food has changed dramatically, not only in the I mean the the restaurant industry, but also in the in terms of producers and um, different suppliers. So the, there's a confidence on the supplier side of things where you get more and more people appreciating what they have, um, and then you have more and more restaurants using those products and becoming more confident. Um, but I suppose I mean really it goes back probably to the sixties and Myrtle Allen and using I suppose Irish cheeses on a cheese board, which sounds like so uh, harmless now, but. You have to remember up to that point when you considered cheese, it was always French cheese. And so she was one of the first to put an Irish cheese on the menu, a farmhouse cheese. And now uh, we do that in, in, in our restaurant in here and also in, in, um, in our little cafe Tartare where we have an Irish cheese board. And now it just seems like a commonplace thing to do. We're still in a transition uh, period and, and also like it really depends on where you go and, and what you look for. And there are places where you can go in Ireland now and have the most amazing uh, Irish food, whether it's uh, in a coffee shop or it's in a, a casual dining restaurant or it's in a fine dining restaurant. There's still a lot of work to do, as there is everywhere. Like It's, it's not that, that uh, there has been one sudden wave and Irish food has just changed. I mean, we still have a lot of the traditional fare and uh, we try and incorporate that into the restaurant in terms of soda bread and, and different traditions and ham and bacon. But we try and, I suppose, lighten it. And you will still have those meals around the country. But for me, it's a lot easier to, um, to I suppose, go somewhere in Ireland and encounter what Irish food might look like now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. man is teaching us about leeks and how to eat them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have a, a man that's cooking with us this weekend and the, we it's called Chef Swap and it pretty much grew out of Food in the Edge because Food in the Edge started three or four years ago and we were inviting chefs over to speak and bring them on a little excursion. And then I thought, well, what more could we do to promote Irish food? Because I suppose two of the, the aims of Food in the Edge, one was to bring really high caliber chefs to Ireland to educate the Irish food community, the industry, whoever it is, it would listen. And also the other one was to show them what Ireland is and all the wonderful produce we have. And so the chef club was how do we take that um, a step further. And most of the chefs that we've had have, have spoken of Food on the Edge. So it's just a nice way to bring them back and then for them to cook with us. And also it, it's, it's really nice because there's always something left when the chef comes into the kitchen, because we're in our own kitchen, we do the same thing we do every day. And so it's nice to bring another chef and upset that a little bit, where you have to put on six or seven new dishes. And then it's always, I mean, in six months time, we might say, oh, remember the way I added that broccoli, and that's a nice kind of thing. And then you, you, it, it, it folds into the menu. And so we've loads and loads of things that just get folded into the menu that might look like um, Irish and something that we have, have done. But there's, there's a lot of, I suppose, communication and networking in food and you're always getting ideas and it's just nice to I suppose um, open your kitchen out and I think also it, there's a certain honesty and a certain um, a transparency because I think sometimes kitchens are very closed and they don't want to give away things and they don't want to show things uh, how things are done but for me the more people that know these things the easier it is to get f for food to get better. 
we know that you're doing a chef swap with JP, but uh, why also Ireland? Like, why, why did you want to come here and learn more about Irish culture? Um, well, I love Ireland. I've been here a couple of times, and there's always something new to learn. And what I really like doing is going to all these places and um, learning about their traditions and their food and then figuring out how I can use a little bit of that in my own restaurant. What do you think people in North America don't know about Irish cuisine that you have experienced? Um, how actually, I mean, how fresh it is. Every time I come here, I'm really surprised by sort of, um, I guess in my mind, I think it's sort of like this like stew culture. <laughs> and it's not. Um, there's just a so many fresh vegetables and uh, seafood and I don't eat meat, but I know there's beautiful meat here and the cheeses and it's really sort of alive and vibrant. And I think really, truly people think that Irish food is just stew and bread. <laughs>
vegetable consumption amongst the lower classes was viewed as being problematic. The one exception to the rule was always cabbage. It was always there. And in fact, consumption of cabbage throughout the 19th century increases when other vegetables are decreasing. So in that sense, it's the story of self-sufficiency of smallholders. But I suppose the prestigious ingredient on that plate is the bacon, because the pig is a great animal. It's very economical. Uh, pigs will eat what you're eating, or the waste from the household. And then once the animal is slaughtered, almost the entire animal is edible, every single bit of him. But then if you want to keep him, you need to preserve the good pieces like the hams and the fletches. And these are pieces that would be kept in the house if you're keeping the pig yourself. And these were saved for special occasions. So maybe for Sunday dinners, for festive occasions, for weddings and so on. Uh, if you wanted to have a piece of meat, which was the symbol of celebration and luxury and so on, the one that was easy and prevalent and to hand was bacon. So when you put the plate together of bacon, potatoes and cabbage, what you have there in fact is not a stereotype at all, but it's a plate that's celebratory and it's telling a particular story, not just what the people want to celebrate with, but also a celebration of colonisation, of trade, of self-sufficiency and of how these things come together and produce a food culture, particularly in rural Ireland, until well into the 20th century. Okay, so we're going to Ackle Island today. We, what did we do yesterday? We went to a cheese shop yesterday, and then we drove up and got lost <laughs> in the mountains of Ireland for like six hours. Uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing today. Yeah. Ackle Island, sea salt. Wow. Let's do it. Wow. <laughs> The summer of 2013 was when we first brought some salt to the market. And we decided we'd try it out in our kitchen on a very small scale and it worked and the demand grew for it. We, we had great support, really fantastic support in our own local area in Aachen. Everybody got behind us because maybe they felt this is their product as well. So for us to make a product from our local area and create employment and use the natural resource that surrounds us, that has, and, and it's, it's a great thing for us. And indeed, the sea has been the lifeblood of generations here on the island. So to use that resource is something that we feel is very sustainable. People have become much more discerning in, in Ireland. People who go to restaurants and supermarket consumers really want to know where the food comes from. They read the label and they want to know who the suppliers are in restaurants. But that's a good thing because we have so much to offer as a country uh, with food between the land and the sea. plastic to glass uh, um, because obviously plastic is choking our oceans and that's our main resource. I 
we were a family business, so that gives its own challenges. Um, however, I think family business is the core of, of, of Irish business. Every day is different. You, you can't, there is no day that we start at nine and finish at five. When we started this, I was, I was teaching, I was a secondary school teacher. Now it doesn't seem like I, I go to work at all. It seems it's something I have to do. It doesn't feel like work. Yeah, we're very happy with the way it's going. We're very proud of it. As a cook with a background in pastry, I feel like salt is probably one of the most underused ingredients in desserts. So this is where I wanted to feature it. We used it in everything, from the mousse, to the shortbread, to the caramel. Why do you make cheese? Um, I make cheese because I was always into old crafts. When I was young, there was, I wanted to become a shoemaker or a hat maker, basket maker, but all these things died out. So I came across with the cheese making and um, fell in love with it. Went to the Alps in Switzerland and there you, I, I trained the really old way. There was no electricity. You make um, cheese in a big cup of it. You have to make the fire underneath. You go and milk the cows nearly by hand. I was never interested in studying or learn the um, industry way of making cheese with machines. And, um, Germany wasn't an option for me to become um, self-employed. I was young and had no money and my mother moved here years before and I went on holidays and discovered that Ireland is actually the ideal place. My name is Maya Bourgeois and I live in Kilcommon here on the Dingle Peninsula and I run the cheese shop in Chile where I sell cheese and cook also lunches, salads and soups. I opened the little cheese shop in Dingle seven, eight years ago. And I know Trulie very well as well, and I always found that it needed a shop as well, and it needed some more than just cheese, it needs good food. I brought this old way of cheese making here and wanted to make sure it's kept that way, make everything by hand and then, but I also needed to think about, you know, a speci speciality which I wanted to create for this area. I came here and made um, the Deliscus, which is a cheese, a raw milk cheese with seaweed inside. Um, and I use the seaweed because it's an old traditional ingredient which the Irish people kind of lost using and I wanted to bring it to life again. Mm -hmm. 
it, it was always um, very successful. People really liked the idea. The older people came and said, oh yeah, we're gonna tell you stories and I used to eat seaweed and my grandmother used to pick it. So the cheese by now has become really an, an, um, a delicatessen from this area, which is very nice. It's nice to be able to write a little bit of history somewhere and leave it behind. We held the Irish dinner because we wanted to change how people thought about Irish food. Yes, Irish cuisine is in part made up of potatoes and cabbage, but there is so much more. Next time you think about Irish cuisine, we hope that you go a little deeper. Think about the sea, the rich diversity of Irish seaweed and sea life, the beautiful fish and shellfish. Think about dairy. Irish butter and cheese are some of the best in the world. Think about the small artisan producers of products like sea salt, the small farmers growing incredible fresh produce year round, and the chefs taking these incredible products and bringing them to life. I, for one, will think of the people. I've traveled a lot in my life, but I've never felt more welcome or been treated with more kindness so far from home than by the people of Ireland. We wanted to bring a little bit of Ireland back to Canada by holding the Irish Bela. But the thing is, I think if you're lucky enough to spend time in Ireland, it stays with you. And you bring that with you, whether you know it or not. Thank you.